This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. It may not look very comfortable, but before huts and houses, this was home. In fact, this cave at Cheddar Gorge may well be one of the oldest homes in the country. Between five and 10,000 years ago, families of Stone Age hunter-gatherers, the old cavemen of legend, probably used this cave to eat, sleep, shelter, and do whatever else they did. But to find what they left behind isn't gonna be easy. Thousands of years of rainfall have washed tons and tons of mud into this cave and washed an awful lot of the evidence deep into the tunnels behind. We've got just three days and if we're going to find anything at all, we're going to have to dig an awful long way down there and an awful long way into there. Cheddar Gorge is a three-mile gash carved by an ancient river into Somerset's Mendip Hills. Our cave, Cooper's Hole, is one of several along the length of the gorge thought to have been inhabited in the Stone Age, though no one knows for sure because it's never properly been excavated by archaeologists. But any remains down there are in danger because the gorge is a popular venue for cavers who sometimes unintentionally destroy valuable archaeology. So Time Team's main goal is to get Cooper's Hole scheduled and so protected from unofficial excavation. To do that, all we need is some proof, however small, that it was once inhabited. Our starting point is the car park by the cave mouth. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. We have tons of exclusive documentaries about the most important people in history that you will not find anywhere else. Our extensive catalogue of documentaries covers everything from the rise of Hannibal Barker to the illustrious treasures of King Tut. So sign up today for broadcast quality documentaries uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. So why are we standing around in a car park? Oh, I thought you were going to take me in a cave. You are in a cave. <laughs> it doesn't look like that to <laughs> I, me. <laughs> I know it doesn't, but the cave used to extend out here into the car park. Right out here. So the entrance is probably over there somewhere, or somewhere out there. Yeah. All this rock up above you has been quarried. That's it's been why it's taken all back. sort of angular, That's why it? it's all angular and not sort of that nice natural green soft look that other parts of the gorge have got. So we're well inside the cave just here. What we know from caves, not just here in, in the gorge, but all around the world, is that people live where the daylight comes in, not much further back. So you would expect to find a hearth near the entrance to the cave, maybe another one over there. They would have had their reindeer roasted on this hearth that might have been here or something like that that was around the area 12,000 years ago. I can see where this is leading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you reckon you can target us in, John? Well, I'm not sure about the reindeer. <laughs> well, it's probably long gone, but um, the I, signs of a hearth and the, the artefacts, if they're going to be here... I don't think we're going to find that sort of detail. At yeah. best, we could give you an estimate of the depth of the deposits above bedrock. And if the bedrock is actually narrowing for an entrance, it's yeah. just possible we can get that. While John and Paul search for the original entrance of the cave under the car park, Carenza's attention is fixed on the inside of the cave. 
She's met up with cave archaeologist Kate Robson-Brown and veteran caver Malcolm Cotter to try and work out where else we should dig. You tunnel out. You actually did dig out all we did. of these tunnels. We did. Malcolm spent four years exploring Cooper's Hole nearly 40 years ago. He was looking for an underground cave system he believes lies under the gorge. Cheddar, Did you is... find it? No, we didn't, unfortunately. No. Uh, hi, hello. Hello. But what interests us is that on the way, he dug through some archaeology. What did you find, Malcolm? Um, well, we didn't find the cave that we were looking for, but we did find a few bones. We found some pottery. What sort of bones did you find? Well, we found horse, um, oh. sheep, boss. Um, Bosses is, is, is cows. cows. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. A horse is quite important though because of course there haven't been wild horses in this part of the ah. world for ten thousand years. So we're talking well ah. into the ice age. Yeah. Oh. Ah. That's so ah, this was this was see. this was through here. here. And is it just down that way we want to go? No, there's one to the left as well. Here? Did you find anything in there? Yes we did. We found a flint tool. Really? Tool. Yeah. It could have been washed in yeah. or fallen through. Well it could have fallen through, through, through a, a cavity, which is this. So What's the These might have been just the proof needed to get the cave scheduled. Unfortunately, not realising their archaeological value, Malcolm no longer has them in his possession. But he can at least show us where he found them, and maybe we can find some of our own. Good luck, Malcolm. Malcolm's first destination is Tunnel 1, where he found the animal bones, and where he says there are plenty more. He found them in a bed deep down the tunnel, under a layer of hard white deposit called the Stal Floor. This was formed at the end of the last ice age, 7,000 years ago, when climatic conditions caused water flowing through caves to leave behind a layer of solid calcium carbonate. For archaeologists, it's a geological signpost towards the Stone Age beneath. So animal bones under the stall should be remains of a Stone Age meal and could be proof the cave was inhabited. But getting to them is going to be really tricky. A huge flood in 1968 filled the cave with tons of mud and rubbish, which we'll have to re-excavate. And today, the deteriorating weather is making conditions in the tunnels treacherous. Oh, I'm getting to a, a very soggy, horrible bit now. Not so nice. Pools of water. Oh, what a, oh dear. Lying flat out now to make progress. It looks as if it's getting very narrow, doesn't it? Yeah. If you look on this bottom plan here... So he's going the down that step. tube there. Yeah. He's only there, yeah. and he's yeah. on his back, and he hasn't got to that bit yet. I can now see pretty well to the top of where we had to break through the stalagmite floor. I'm just going to get a closer look. I'm crawling now quite tight here. He must be moving down here now. Yeah. Now... The, the, bad, the bad news is that the little step down below the stalagmite floor that we reached in 1962 is now blocked up with sediments. Oh, right. That's down, that's that's down right the end there. Do you think we'll be able to get it out? Yeah, it should be possible to get it out. Be a, it'll be a big effort, though. Within a day, you may be able to get to the rim of the stalagmite floor. Yeah. Now to get below the stalagmite floor into the into the bone beds, you may need another day. So right. he's saying two days before to, we could to get, get under to the, the to get to the stalagmite floor. floor, yeah. Yeah. So already we're under pressure and bearing the brunt, our team of cave diggers. Coming now. Thank you. They've got to shift several tonnes of wet earth more than 100 feet up a steep, slippery slope in a very tight space. OK, take it away. <laughs> ah. 
and they've got to do it quickly, or we might not even reach the bones within three days. Our cave is just one of several in the gorge thought to have been inhabited in the Stone Age. And in fact, this is one of the richest areas in the country for Stone Age archaeology. Mick, what would have been so attractive for a caveman about this area? But it's mainly because they used the gorge to ambush animals that are coming off the lowland in front of us, down on the Somerset levels, moving up the gorge as an easy access onto the grazing on the top. Would they have hunted on the slopes or down the bottom? I think they're down the bottom. You can see how narrow it is through here. If you hit behind those rocks and the horses were coming up through what was probably a boulder-strewn stream bed, they'd be very easy to pick off from the side. So this was really the classic ambush? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about it, but the general feeling is that hunter-gatherers, once they got themselves organised, they weren't short of, short of food at all. You know, they just had to have the right strategy to knock off dinner. It's the discarded remains of this dinner we're hoping to find at the back of the cave in Tunnel 1. But if there is anything there, it's most likely to be fragments washed in by the weather. To find more substantial evidence of human occupation, we'll need to excavate the main living area in the original entrance to the cave, which is what John's been looking for under the car park. Yeah. And we've produced the results specially for you. Oh, oh. pull over oh, straight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just like yeah. the pull over. <laughs> In fact, his ground radar results have picked up a hard surface, perhaps the bedrock, about five metres down. And he's also found what could be the original cave wall, which means the entrance and the main living area were probably on one side of it. But five metres is very deep, and I wonder if we'll ever get that far. Only one way to prove it now is to dig all get across it. Malcolm, meanwhile, has set off down Tunnel 2, where he found a flint tool back in the 60s. But he doesn't get very far. Secure looking plywood there. Reckless cavers have recently caused a huge rockfall at the tunnel entrance, and they've only put up a flimsy sheet of plywood to hold back several tons of rubble. The tunnel is too dangerous to explore, and Malcolm beats a hasty retreat. With Tunnel 2 off the menu, our only lead inside the cave is the bone bed in Tunnel 1. And progress here's slow because Kate and Larry, the archaeological policemen on this dig, have insisted we take time out to examine every cubic inch of spoil, even though we're still clearly digging through debris from the 1968 flood. It's definitely a cola can. Kate, why are you giving us such a hard time? Every time we get one trowel full of earth out of that cave, you slow us down and you look at it. If we'd been digging out here, we'd have been finished by now. Yeah, I know, but there is a simple answer, and that's really these sediments in caves have been formed, deposited over thousands, uh, in, in, in the broad scale, millions of years. And what we need to do is not just understand what's going on within any one layer, but their relationships to each other in three-dimensional space. And to do that, we have to go through it with a fine tooth comb. We have to take it step by step. I mean, sometimes these cave sites may be exposed only 10 or 15 centimetres in a, in a year, maximum. So you're going really fast? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> not inside the cave, we're not. <laughs> There's another thing about the story, about the way we're working. There are so few caves which are actually intact, un undisturbed. Mm -hmm. This is one of them. And once we found evidence that people actually lived at this cave, whether in the front of the cave or in the back of the cave or in the middle, well, then we can ask for the site to be scheduled, to be protected for the nature, for the, for the nation, for the future. That's our real ultimate objective. At least we've been allowed to dig relatively quickly in the car park trench. And with promising results just a metre under the surface. These bones all belong to animals that humans might eat. But were they Stone Age animals? 
probably the most interesting item is this. That's a it's a lower it's a third lower molar of a red deer. Um, it's rather a big individual. Now this is an interesting find because red deer is one of the characteristic animals of the 12,000 year old fauna. This is when we know humans were living in the area at the, the end of the last cold stage. It's, it's quite a large tooth and we know that the, the late glacial deer were quite big. So I'd say that was, that was quite a winner at the moment. Tea time day one, they've been digging for about three hours and as you can see from the stratification, they've got down to the 1970s, so there's still some way to go before we get to the Stone Age, but the diggers have started getting excited and Malcolm and Larry are going to go down and see what's happening. What's it all about? Well, we've heard they've come to the edge of the break in the stalagmite floor. This is exciting. This is where the bones, which Malcolm talked about earlier, are underneath that floor. So that gives us a sealed, potentially datable deposit that could be the Stone Age we're looking for is underneath there. Get going. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> After you, Malcolm. <clears throat> Some water down, Larry, because, because it's so cramped, it's actually going to take them about 10 minutes to crawl the 100 feet or so to the break in the stall floor. But of course, in Stone Age times, the cave would have been much less full of mud and flood debris. It might even have been quite spacious. In fact, it could have looked something like this. Goff's Cave, 300 yards down the valley. The difference between Goff's Cave here and Cooper's Hole up the gorge is the sediment's been removed from the, the front of Goff's Cave already. Look, over here. See the stalagmite coming down from the ceiling? No. It's got a truncated base to it. It's got a flat base. That was where it was resting on the sediment level, right up here above our heads. Oh, right. Okay? So, so effectively, the silt before this cave was dug out in the 19th century was as right above our heads. Certainly was. And if you trace that across here to the wall, you can see the remains of the old stalagmite floor. This is the deposit that capped the 10,000-year-old sediments that we're looking for. Like we've got now at Just Cooper's like Hole. Just like Cooper's Hole. Yeah. Well, right, now speak to me. Certainly stout floor. Oh, yeah. Now. Oh, I mustn't follow that down. See if we can find a lip. Ah. It's angular. Look, look, yeah, look. that hollow in the middle. I think I'm too big for this. <laughs> Do you want to run a little water on? Yeah, Let's we'll clean run, it up yeah, and yeah, then. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, that's a Malcolm edge. By unblocking five metres of the tunnel and exposing the hole in the stall floor, the diggers have achieved part one of their task. Now all they've got to do is empty the hole of flood debris. But to reach the bone bed, they might have to dig several metres down, and that, according to Malcolm's calculations, could take at least another day. So for the diggers, there's the prospect of a long night ahead. Eight o'clock, end of my day one, but they're still beavering away, trying to get rid of all the muck so tomorrow we can get down onto the archaeology and see what's under all that white stuff. Let's hope it doesn't take them too long. Night, Meg. Night, so. On tomorrow, I'm going down that hole. Join us after the break. Have a wobble test on the helmet. That'll, that'll do. Nine o'clock, day two, and it's my turn to go down the cave. Larry's promised to show me the hole in the stall floor, and I've got to report back to Mick on the diggers' overnight progress. If I ever get down there. It is quite unpleasant. I have my doubts about sanity, cave. 
the mud's going up my arms now. Anyway. While I'm struggling to get to grips with the intricacies of caving, in the incident room, the owner of the gorge, Lord Bath, has arrived, and he wants to know if we've found any evidence of Stone Age activity on his estate. And here we've got very fine third lower molas, a wisdom tooth of a red deer. Makes a red deer to look rather a fierce animal, but they're, uh, uh, yes, they're well, for grass. Probably at close quarters, they're fierce enough. <laughs> When we first discovered this yesterday, it, uh, I thought, well, this is rather a large individual and large red deer, one of the animals that was common in the area about 12,000 years ago. Now we've washed it and had a better look at it, my feeling is that the preservation suggests it's not really very old. And so far, we haven't actually found any evidence of human activity other than the fact that some of these are domestic animals. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about the finds themselves that suggests that humans were responsible for this material getting mm -hmm. in. Of course, the fact that the sheep and the pig are both domesticated, you know, yeah. you don't get domesticated animals without humans being around, so but indirectly. You do, yeah, yeah, you do find them wandering up and down the gorge even today. That's and, true, so, yes. and the yeah. cliffs are kind of steep, so <laughs> plungy, plungy, death, death. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think some of these could be accidental introductions. And his guess is that the bones are Iron Age or later, which means the car park trench is still several thousand years and as much as four metres above the Stone Age. But unfortunately, we can't just plough on down. The archaeological police are on hand to ensure we finish analysing the top layers first. How long do you think it's going to take to excavate and investigate it to your satisfaction? Because obviously from... We're hoping to try and get down to Paleolithic layers. Yeah. This is above that. I was wondering how long. Realistically, you were we're looking at getting this loose out, cleaning up, getting people in here, middle of the afternoon. Right. So now even the car park trench is on a go slow. 48. 48. <laughs> but at least the hole in the stall floor has progressed. This is the bottom. Yeah. 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 Overnight, the diggers have cleared about half a metre of soil and revealed a nice section below the lip of the stall. And just in time for our VIP visitor. Yeah, tell, us, tell us what you're looking at. I, I, we've got quite a good picture now. Can you see the point of my trowel? Yes, that, that's, that, that's Larry there. Yeah, we can see that, Larry. This is the top of the stalagmitic floor. Right, got it. Yeah. This is the calcium carbonate crust, which we hope is sealing deposit underneath which has bone and maybe even stone tools. Yeah, the, this, this stall floor is about a foot thick. I'd imagine that it would just be a thin crust like icing sugar, but it's a really solid thing. And just below it, you've got lots of little broken off little pieces of flinty looking material. Tony, um, is there anything you can actually see in that section under the stalagmitic floor that, that you know, might be bone or... Anything like that? Not oh, yet. Can't... It really needs cleaning up. It's, um, we're just looking at a small window at the moment and the pit itself still hasn't been completely um, cleared of, of the debris from, from the uh, 1968 flood. And, and... Has Lord Bath got any questions or should we just continue checking out his property? The theory of what you're finding, even though you're not finding at the moment, <laughs> but it is most interesting. The theory of it. <laughs> well, it is only day two, and there's still plenty of digging to do before we expect to hit the bones. But we're not just here in search of finds. To help us understand the site, we're going to reconstruct how our, or Lord Bath's, cave would have looked in the Stone Age. Victor's busy sketching the entrance. And the surveyors have brought along a neat little gizmo that'll record the shape and texture of the inside of the cave. Meanwhile, John Gator and his team are trying to find the original cave floor so we can tell how big it was. The technology works on a reassuringly primitive level. Make a noise with a big hammer and see if it bounces off a hard surface under the mud into the geophone stuck into the silt. Okay. 
All this information will be given to Steve to plug into his computer. And by the end of tomorrow, we should have an accurate picture of what the cave looked like 10 to 12,000 years ago. When you say Stone Age, I think of the Flintstones and <laughs> men with clubs and dragging women yeah, by the hair. Yeah. What do we mean? By the Stone Age. Well, I think you have to remember that when the early archaeologists were faced with finding this stuff, they had a load of stone implements, a load of bronze implements, and a load of iron implements before they got to the Romans. So the logic was to say the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. So they were pigeonholes, really, for archaeologists to put information into. They didn't necessarily reflect anything more than the technology. And we classify the, the Stone Age according to sort of details of the way the tools are made. There's the, the Paleolithic Age, the Old Stone Age, there's the Mesolithic Age, the Middle Stone Age, there's the Neolithic Age. So imaginative you know. classification. So it's an imaginative <laughs> classification, yeah, it's not, it's not subtle. But if you, you actually look at some of the tools, you can get the idea. About 12,000 years ago, people were making blade tools out of, out of churts like flint. Ordinary flint of South East England. That's nice stuff, Andy. Where's that from? Beautiful stuff. This is actually from Goss Cave here right in Cheddar. Right the corner from us. Yeah. yeah. Then in the, in the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age, you get these rather smaller tools that are beautifully made. That's great, Tony, because if you look at the end of that, look, it's got the three facets, just like a modern steel drill. Oh, what? There and there and yeah, there. Yeah. 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 And what they would use those kind of things for is for carving grooves in bone and bits of wood in order to set other pieces like this in with resin so they could make things like drills and saws. Then in the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, you see a sort of departure into new technologies and this is where we see a lot of these wonderful polished axe heads. So which of this stuff are we likely to find here? What I would like to see coming out of, of Cooper's Hole is very definitely these, these blade type tools of, of about 12,000 years ago. I hear you two have dropped out and turned into cavemen. Well, dear Dead right, right. Tony. Yeah. Yeah, we what are you up to? Well off. <laughs> OK, this is a, a thing that's known as a baton de commandement. It's from Goff's Cave just down the road. It's the base of a reindeer antler that's had a hole bored right through from both sides and a spiral ornament put in. And what's it called? A baton de commandement? baton de commandement. So there's an asking stick? An asking <laughs> stick. So is that one of these examples of archaeologists finding something? They've no idea what it is at all, but because it looks the way it does, they think, oh, this is some sort of object you, <laughs> you hold up yeah. when you want to speak to the tribe. That's some, the gist, that's some, the gist some, of it. <laughs> some bit of nonsense like that, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's obviously a tool because of the way it's worn. It's obviously something that you grasp to use. And we'd really like to try and find out a little bit more about what you can do with them. Uh, we can't do anything with this one. This is 12,000 years old and it's a bit fragile. So what we want Phil to do is to make a replica of this and then see what we can do with so it. So we've got a piece of reindeer antler and we're going to turn that into one of those. But first, he's got to make a set of Stone Age tools. Phil's an expert flint napper and he should be ready to start carving before the end of the day. That's a nice blade, that is. Back at the site, we've got another lead. A local caver who stopped by to see what we're up to has told us about another tunnel in the cave, and Carenza and Larry are off to investigate. You recommend hands and knees or bum? Bum. The new tunnel, Tunnel 3, runs down the centre of the cave, parallel to Tunnel 1, from which it's separated by a wall of mud. And there's water down there. Really? Yeah. According to the caver, it was opened very recently, and there's a break in the stall floor here which might offer access to the Stone Age without having to dig through the 1968 flood. There's a break there, isn't there? Yeah. And there's a hedge here. Is that it? That's it, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is full of scree, and we're looking into the stalagmitic floor going that way. So it's. Is that a bit of... what's that in there? Is that just a bit of... It's a bit of... I thought it was a bit of jawbone for a minute. It looks less like mm. it now. I've poked at mm. it for a bit. That's called wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Yeah, more desperation, I'm not sure. Right, we could yeah. clean this up and that would give us a section there. Uh, give us a it? section. Another one. So with Carenza installed in Tunnel 3, about 70 feet from the cave mouth, we've now got people scraping away in two tunnels. And with no Stone Age finds to our credit so far, there's an urgency about their work. Things are moving faster in the car park trench too. Kate is at last satisfied we've finished analysing the relatively recent layers and the next stop for the digger driver will be the Stone Age, if he can reach it. He changed my view of Stone Age technology. In what way? I'd I never saw these tools as being that efficient. Oh, you have little faith, you see. <laughs> but look at it. God, that's going in better than a metal tool. Yeah, I, mean, I know that's... it is. <laughs> and look at the, look at me. Look at those shavings coming out. That is incredible. Yeah, I, I, I'm impressed. I think. I... Oh, good lord! Daylight. Oh, we're through already. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Yeah. That is good. Well, it's amazing. Never... It's going to be easy to make, isn't God, it? Right, isn't it? We well, could make dozens of them. Well, no, I don't think we want to go quite that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could make do okay, dozens of them. I could watch you, you make, make dozens, dozens of them. Of them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because the wet weather's right. Back in Tunnel yeah. 1, a metre and a bit beneath the stall, yeah, so the diggers have the finally hit something. Sadly, it's not bones. It's rather more substantial. Um, that is very likely to be the local water table, which is not helped by the fact that the weather is so wet this week, which would have raised it by a metre or so. Now, if that is the water table, it represents quite a few million gallons of water. If the bones are only a few inches down, we may be all right. Any deeper, and we'll be pumping out a river. Uh, is there room for me to come in there, Malcolm? Yes, yes, yes. OK. But when Malcolm and Larry investigate for themselves, it turns out we've been digging in the wrong place anyway. We didn't find any bone that day. You I don't remember was... seeing it that way. The bone is there. Here. The bone is there. X marks the spot. Yes. Now, um, now. Oh, now what will happen, the stalagmite floor will meet the roof. So your trench is actually bigger than, than we originally thought. We thought we were just going to be a little, little square. Oh, no, no. There's a step down that yes. uh, no, shows a couple yet. of metres. Okay. Um, so we've got to clear out a new area under the stall, even further down the tunnel. That, that sediment's above the floor. Yes, we may... say that. The passage of 38 years has obviously affected Malcolm's initial memory of where he saw the bones. But at least he's now confident we're finally on the right track. And the more he scrapes, the sharper his memory gets. Sorry. OK, go on. The bones are under the roof in that direction. That's right. Right, down, down here. Yes, down there. I would say about one and a half metres below your trail, oh. in that direction. They'll be swimming. <coughs> oh, it have to be pumped. It has to be pumped. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Were the bones easily spotted? They were. They were there, they were sticking out. They, they were, yes. And, and you left some behind? Oh, we did. Oh, yes. good. Oh, good. Well, I think we have to do it. Yes. I think we really have to do it. But the diggers are exhausted and can only drag up a few trugs. Better to stop now and start again refreshed tomorrow. Oh, wonderful, thank you. It's uh, end of day two. It's been a very exciting day, but incredibly frustrating. We've dug this huge hole here that's so deep, we're practically in New Guinea, and we haven't had one single find out of it. We've burrowed deep, deep, deep into there, and again, not one find, but now there's a chink of light. Join us after the break and see if tomorrow we can find Malcolm's bones. Nine o'clock, day three, and the hunt's on for Malcolm's bones. But something really frustrating has happened, which is that we've got to close down 
this main trench. It's so deep now that the shovel on the digger can't even reach it anymore and it's been raining all night so the sides have started crumbling in and it's far too dangerous for anyone to work in there anymore. Larry, yesterday you said to me that you wanted to dig like crazy until you got down onto the real archaeology and then you'd have to start being careful. Well, we've got nowhere near there yet, have we? Well, we haven't got to the, uh, the Stone Age, we haven't got to the Paleolithic, which, um, to be honest, I'm not, uh, not too unhappy about that because I, I was frankly worried that we were going to, at this rate, break into it and actually destroy some evidence. But that's, well, that's why we were digging. Well, you can't say, well, yeah. I was worried because I thought we might hit on the archaeology. But we haven't lost anything. But we gained, wouldn't have lost anything, we no, just sat in the car all weekend. But we've gained a lot of information about the site and the way it's formed. I mean, if you look over the edge, you can see some large boulders in the section down there, which are so large that they probably collapse off this ruin. So we actually have perhaps identified where the original outline, the edge of the roof was, which is what we said on day one we were looking for, because that helps to find where people might have been living. Well, I'm glad that you're happy about it. I think yeah. the rest of us are extraordinarily <laughs> frustrated. <laughs> Although we haven't been able to reach the Stone Age in this trench, we can at least tell how much we missed it by. These are the seismics we did yesterday from actually in the cave. There's the surface right. dipping down into the cave, and this is our predicted solid floor level. And this is the concrete wall here, and I just... John thinks his seismic survey has revealed the depth of the stale floor, the top of the Stone Age, the the under the car park. Right, so we want height to his eye level. And using another piece of neat electronics, we can measure the depth of our hole. The difference in the two numbers is the distance from the bottom of our trench to the stall and the margin by which we've fallen short of our target. Can you see to the bottom from there? Yeah, no problem. OK. Should have the result now. Uh, oh, yeah, at uh, 3.7. You what, have you got, what have you got, John? Come <laughs> no, on. Look, I have written down here, what, Phil? 3.6. 3.6? 3 metres 60. So we've actually got the bottom, then. <laughs> or rather, the top of the interesting bit, and we've had to stop. That really is frustrating. There's not much to cheer in Tunnel 1, either. It's pouring in. Larry and the cavers have now excavated deep into the new area where the stall floor meets the roof of the cave and water is pouring into the hole. Can we push the pump forward a bit? Yeah. I've got my foot under it. The only hope is that they can pump it out faster than it's coming in. Well, it's all right, but you know what's going to happen when we turn it off? Well, um, let's keep it on. Well, it makes it difficult for me to work. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to turn it off and shift it out. I'm going to have to get in there and give it a good go. OK. All right, so... Right. Turn it off! Next door, in Tunnel 3, Carenza's digging in relative comfort. And although she's still above the water table, she's hit a layer of orange sandy soil beneath the stall that could at last take us further back in time than the 1960s. This is what we've been looking for, this colour sediment in hole one. I think, and what does that say to you? Well, this says to me that this is a, certainly pre-68 when the floods were here. All right. we're getting in tunnel one is the grey sort of, if you like, Very road, road second, gravel. Yeah washed in, but this is a lot different. Brilliant. So this orange layer looks like it could be our best bet for Stone Age finds inside the cave. There it goes. Yeah. Phil, meanwhile, has decided his best route to the Stone Age is the Baton de Camelmont. Give it a flex. Well, it's coming. Look at that, then. Stone Age technology okay. wins again. That's a bit more like it. Now all he's got to do is carve some spiral grooves into the hole and we'll be ready to work out what it was actually for. It's now 2.30, day three, and we still haven't got one single find, have we? Uh, no, not to speak of. Not to speak of does mean no. <laughs> Larry, can you hear me? Sir Tony. Have you found anything yet? We're in a very exciting moment here. We've turned the corner, Andy's on his back, digging through muck, water's pouring in, and we think we hit the old tunnel that uh, Malcolm described this morning. 
But can you actually see anything down there? Uh, chocolate mousse. <laughs> chocolate, right. chocolate mousse. That means no. Carenza, how are things... Where you are. Hello, Tony. Well, we're just going down through this orange layer, which we think may be the pre-style layer. Over. Well, that's good. And have you found anything down there? Well, we found a couple of very small bones, probably rodent, but that's all so far. Over. So basically nothing? Well, a couple of small bones, yeah, over. OK, thanks. That's good. Two rodent bones. What do you mean, that's good? That's good. Tell us something about the environment. Well, it could be... From 1960? Well, not if it's on in the clay layer under the style layer. So we have a time team in which we find two rodent bones. Are we going to get anything more than that before the end of the day? I think it's unlikely. At the right. moment. Seconds later, with water rising fast, the situation in Tunnel 1 takes a turn for the worse. Gritty. The pump, the most powerful we could fit down a tunnel full of working cavers, is struggling. The mud's too thick. It's time for a brainwave. Larry, Mick the Dig is suggesting that we actually put more water down there in order to dilute the sludge so that you can bring more sludge up. Is that a sensible idea or is it total madness? <laughs> Complete madness. <laughs> we'll forget that one, Mick. Yeah, we'll forget it. <laughs> Getting down to the Stone Age seems like an increasingly distant prospect in our cave. And if that's not bad enough, Andy Currant's wetting our appetite with lots of Stone Age bones he excavated from Goff's cave ten years ago. One of the most intriguing things he found was evidence of cannibalism. Here in Britain, we're very much on the edge of the range of modern humans about 12,000 years ago. And all the evidence we've got is that life was nasty, brutish and short. There's a little friend of mine here which we dug up in Goff's cave a few years ago. It's the top of a human skull yeah. and it's covered in long parallel cut marks that have been made with a, a stone tool. This guy's been skinned. But how do you know that that's cannibalism yeah. and not simply stripping a body down to the bones for some ceremonial reasons? Well, the only evidence we've got for that, I suppose, is circumstantial. The animal bones that we found in the same dig were horse and red deer, and the remains have been treated in exactly the same way. All the long bones have been smashed up, it looks as though they're after marrow fat, and it, it looks as though they, they just weren't wasting anything. You know, so when Granny died... Are you going to clean up a bit now? Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's that charcoal there we had. Is that a bone? Oh, God. It is a bone. You're right, it is. Oh. Wow. It may not be human, it may not even be very old, but in Tunnel 3, Carenza's at last found a decent-sized bone. This looks like something cheeky-sized, I, I would reckon it, I guess, but it's mm. a bit difficult to tell, and I'm... The classic words, I'm not an expert on <laughs> yeah. bones, but... Take it up to Andy Current and see what he thinks. Whatever it turns out to be, this and any other bones Carenza can unearth may be our only hope of proving the cave was inhabited. Because in Tunnel 1, the chances of reaching any archaeology are looking frailer by the minute. Can we have the chain gang down here? We're going to drown. The pump's finally given up the ghost, so all they can do is bail. You can't really tell. Cave from cave, no, no, we'll be coming part of the cave. Ready? Pop! Yeah. Uh, ready? Pop! Pop! Stop. Stop. Oh, he's coming back again. <laughs> Ian, are you just dumping? Oh, please. That's great, isn't it? You see, it's got that spiral -y bit inside. Far away from this vision of hell, Phil and Andy have finished the baton and are now ready to work out what it was for. One theory is that it was a thong stropper. 
That's first stripper to you and me. OK, let's, let's drop the thong. So what do we do? Take well, you've got to get it on there somehow. Well, put it on this end and give it, oh, a, give it a good thrashing and see what we can do. Go oh, up and down like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a remarkably effective <laughs> tool we've yeah. made there. Yeah. They had a lot of time on their hands, <laughs> didn't yes. they, prehistoric? I yeah. mean, is that... You it honestly, seems to be a, a knuckle basher, is, actually. Is that yeah, honestly no. what people think? You can't do that. It, it's not sharp enough, is it? If it was for that, it would be like blades. It's, blade it's, from it's inside. just no good, is it? <laughs> I mean, nothing. Let's face it. it. No. got some more bone in here, Pete. There's a sort of iron, iron stained layer here. And certainly one of the bits of bone must have been down here quite long because it's um it's picked up that staining and the other one's just there look mm -hmm. i mean they could be lamb rib bones i guess <laughs> so are there any other theories yes there are uh, it, it could be that it's for controlling a rope actually sort of winching something in like how yeah, well let's it. have a go let's yeah. see if we can do it we've got any rope? Okay, yeah. yeah we've got some it's rope, rope. <clears throat> so Let's see what we can do with it. Where's the end? There's the end. Do you right, want to pass it. that through there, do we? Shove it through. So, that goes through there, there like that. that. Now, yeah, what's well, the theory about what we this need to then, do? Andy? We need a Paleolithic horse, and we haven't got one, so... <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> looks like I'm going to double up. Do. I'm going to double up. I'm going to be a Paleolithic horse who's just been caught. I'm going to tie myself into this noose. And then and, I have uh, to winch you right, in. Right, you've got to winch me in. Let's see, see if we can make this work. I'm going to, winch, I'm going to kick and thrash your belt a bit, right? <laughs> well, you so, winch me in with that. So okay. I do. Oh, here I like come. That. Yes. You grab yes. hold of that, Tony. Yes. I can't get away. I'm thrashing and kicking it. Got him. Oh, I can't get away. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you brought him to his knees. <laughs> what an efficient <laughs> tool. <laughs> now, did well, that actually well, I mean, help you? Well, I don't know, Tony. I didn't really think about it. I mean, I don't know if it's going to help. Let's do it without. And let's see what happens. All right, have you got... Go. I, I mean, if, if we're going <laughs> to... I think I've got enough this wind left test. for this. Yeah, right. right. Without. Without. Start bucking. <laughs> I... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All no, right, stop bucking, <laughs> stop bucking. It, it does, it does make difference. It definitely makes some difference. Truly, you weren't just no, no, loading no. the odds there. Oh, uh, he's near the cardiac arrest. So it, yeah. this, <laughs> this is plausible. Yeah, it's plausible. It yeah. So up until now, the archaeologists have thought it was a totem stick. Yeah. And actually, it was just an ordinary tool. Yeah. That's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> we win. <laughs> <laughs> but in Tunnel 1, the shattered cavers have finally acknowledged defeat. The bone bed remains submerged beneath the sea of mud. Which means it's all down to Carenza and her finds from Tunnel 3. <laughs> Hi, Carenza. <laughs> well, I'm glad you all waited for me. What have you brought for us? <laughs> Right, well, this is the stuff that's come out of this orange layer that we think might be very early. We've got some bones. Ah, bones. <laughs> bones. Right, we've got a load of these little sort of ribby type things there. Yeah. Um, so I assume they're all from the same animal. We've got this tiny little bone here. Be a fish bone, yeah. but, but the interesting bit is that which has obviously got cut marks on it there. Oh, oh yes! Yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a beauty. Oh, really? That's a beauty. You really? Oh, yeah, god! That's just the kind of cut mark you would get if you were opening up the body cavity and cleaning out the insides. It's, you know, it's just on the inside of the inside of the rib cage. But they are, they're certainly cuts made by stone tools. <laughs> hey, are you joking? Are you serious? Yes. Hey, yes. That. Results. Look at that. Cross the yeah, end there. There's another one above yeah. it, and there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, are you happy to say a caveman did that? I would be pretty happy to say that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, <is> that. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly the end of day three, and we have evidence that cavemen lived down our cave. <laughs> <laughs> Now we know our cave was inhabited, 
we can picture what it would have looked like 10 to 12,000 years ago. The gorge itself was much narrower and less densely wooded. The perfect hunting ground. The mouth of the cave would have extended further out into the gorge. And this is where the inhabitants would have lived. Deeper inside, with no mud filling it, the cave would have been very spacious. Spacious enough even for a Stone Age Lord Bath to stand in. And he wasn't able to date the bone precisely, but he would say that the caveman who butchered it lived sometime between the very end of the Stone Age and the early Iron Age. But even that could be enough to get this amazing cave scheduled and its Stone Age secrets protected. <laughs> <laughs>